Great. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you today talking about something that truly is important, as we all know, to power the clean energy future. You can't do it without really a strong, resilient transmission grid. And despite the fact that I think most policymakers, government officials understand the need for transmission, we are still, as you all know, facing obstacles, whether it be inciting permitting or raising the necessary capital to expand and build on the transmission that we need for the clean energy future. Our panel today is going to be talking about what some of those obstacles have been, how they've resolved some of those obstacles, and more importantly, what opportunities might lie ahead. So to get us kicked off, I thought it'd be great for you to hear a little bit from each of the panelists on what their respective companies are about in terms of the size of their grid, the number of customers, give you a little flavor for the companies that they work for. So to get us started, I'm going to kick it off to Ian. Electrification and provision of supply to uh, customers out there, and obviously uh, transmission is a key part of that. I. Uh, I'm going to disappoint everyone and start with the fact that I'm not actually from a, a transmission grid company. Uh, I uh, am part of NZN Global. So NZN is a consulting firm. It focuses on advisory and business transformation. Uh, we also do a, a bit in um, uh, digital technologies, digital twins. We're involved in some renewable expansions. We operate some networks over in um, over in India, uh, and we've got car coverage across India, Spain, Turkey, the UK, Australia, and a couple of other countries. Wonderful, David. So fabulous to be uh, here uh, with everybody. So I'm David Wright. I'm the chief engineer of National Grid. Um, we operate uh, electricity and gas transmission and distribution infrastructure in both the UK and uh, over here in the Northeast US. Uh, we're the largest, one of the largest uh, investor-owned utilities in the US with uh, just under 3 million customers um, operating in New York State and Massachusetts. Um, and uh, in the UK, uh, we um, not only the transmission operator, but we're also uh, the distribution owner for about a, a quarter of the country, um, uh, over 8 million customers in the UK as well. So uh, a big operation, 15,000 kilometres of transmission line, 210,000 uh, kilometers of uh, distribution. Wonderful. Okay, so proud to be here and speak about Terna. Terna is the Italian transmission system operator, which means that we're both the system operator and the owner of the assets. We operate approximately 50,000 miles of HV lines, um, with a, including, let's say, uh, a huge number of interconnections. You know that the shape of Italy, which is a very long peninsula with the Alps on the north and a lot of very deep water sea around, uh, forced us to develop technology and experience in building interconnections on the Alps and also HVDC undersea interconnections all around our, our country. Great. Thank you. Ibrahim? Yes. Uh, good afternoon to all, all of you. I'm uh, Ibrahim Rajambo from SEC, Saudi Electricity Company. I was leading the transmission and system operator. Uh, SEC uh, owns uh, 54 gigawatts of generation, uh, more than 90,000 kilometers of transmission uh, lines, and more than around 800,000 uh, kilometers of uh, distribution. Uh, we have 10, uh, uh, 10 million customers uh, connected to the network. We, uh, we have ambitions targets in the future, especially up to 2030s to double the, 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 the network uh, so that it will accommodate the new renewable ambition that we are uh, reaching 50% in 2030. Uh, uh, plus uh, this, this is, will be a challenging that uh, we have to reach within 2030 and uh, uh, I think that's that's all. Um, but we are we are looking for a future that Saudi Arabia or our network, our grid will be the hub that will be transferring energy within the Middle East. Wonderful. Well, thank you all for being here. Let me go ahead and get started with David. Um, 
David, offshore wind is becoming a bigger, bigger deal in Europe, especially near the UK. When we think about the HVDC link that was built between Norway and the UK, I mean, that is truly a remarkable project. Can you, can you speak to us about some of the challenges? I mean, given the bilateral nature of that, um, what, what did you learn and how did you overcome some of those major issues? Well, first of all, let me just describe a little bit of the project. It is a phenomenal project. There's something about, you know, transmission. Every now and again, you get to do these amazing, amazing projects. And uh, we're just doing more and more of them every year. You know, the pace of them is incredible. But the, the interconnector to uh, Norway, largest subsea uh, interconnector uh, anywhere in the world, um, 720 kilometers uh, in length. Uh, it was done as a joint venture between ourselves and, uh, and Statnet. Um, but some of the uh, engineering challenges on it uh, were absolutely awesome. So um, 1.4 gigawatt um, capacity, um, and we're operating it at 515 uh, kV uh, voltage source uh, commutation. So, um, um, but when you're thinking about engineering a project like that, you know the fact that you're going through um, water. Um, up to 600, 700 meters deep. Um, I learned really a lot about how dark it gets at the bottom of a Norwegian field. <laughs> uh, but we also had to do stuff that we don't normally do as a, a as electricity transmission company. We had to put a tunnel through a, a Norwegian mountain um, to get to actually where we were actually able to build the converter station. So having, you know, people on your payroll who are using explosives and, you know, um, and taking out, you know, that kind of activity, uh, change the risk register and the risk appetite of the board a little bit um, in, in order to get it done. But a phenomenal project. But what's great about it, I think, is, um, you know, Norway's a country which has got huge amounts of hydro uh, power. Um, and as you say, um, in the UK, world leading now offshore wind industry, huge amounts of, of wind and more coming. Um, and so having an interconnector so that on real windy days we can export power to Norway and uh, on still days we can take the power from, from Norway is a real sustainable energy project taking out 23 million tonnes of carbon a year. And in its first year of operation, just to give you a sense of it, um, we imported into the UK 4.6 terawatt hours of green electrons and we exported 1.8. So that's the benefit of these interconnectors. And, and the more renewable generation you have on your, on your network, these kind of investments are going to be required more and more. Just sounds like an amazing engineering feat. Congratulations. Really, really amazing. So let me turn to you, Giacomo. So Turner has the largest number of interconnections with countries of anybody else in Europe. And you're looking to expand, you're looking to go into other countries. What countries are you uh, potentially looking to establish relationships with and have interconnections? Why them? And what are some of the challenges that you're seeing in siting and permitting? Well, in terms of interconnections, as I said, uh, we weren't obliged I mean, to have a lot of interconnections. Otherwise, you know, the big peninsula will be alone. Um, so if you look at the position of Israel inside of the Mediterranean Sea, we are like uh, a natural energy hub. So interconnections across the sea uh, to the Balkans and also the new interconnections with Tunisia, you know, that we are developing and which would be a strategic project, not only for Italy, but also at European level. And in fact, we have received the grant uh, 300 million euros from the European uh, Union. So that would be the say the new and most important interconnection with Africa, which, you know, we, uh, I've seen that the point has been touched before mm -hmm. and it's becoming uh, extremely important in order to connect the, the two continents. So um, based on that, we, we see that we can play a role also outside of Italy where we can leverage this experience. So in particular, the big interconnections, HVDC and undersea cables. So we, we are planning, we actually have cables installed down to 1,600 meters depth, and we're planning the new one, the famous uh, Tyrrhenian link, which would be the biggest project ever done in Viterna, close to 4 billion euros investment. Uh, cables will be laid down to 2,100 meters water depth. So with this experience uh, and the relationship we have established with the main suppliers, so we are looking at areas where we can you know, there is need for this type of projects. 
Wonderful. In terms of, you know, siding yeah. and permitting, um, again, we have seen this point touched in previous panels. What we think uh, is extremely important is public engagement and public consultations. So you really need to explain the benefits of your projects and try to understand which are, you know, the way you can design the project and the technology you can use in order to have the best appreciation by people on, on site. And I can tell you that, you know, if you, if you think about Italy, uh, it's very complex to build new assets in Italy. So every time that you can use uh, a right of way on an existing infrastructure, or if you can just, you know, simplify the network, when you build something new, you can destroy or demolish something old, or looking at, you know, um, architecture, uh, the external um, architecture of converting stations, which is, you know, a very uh, tall building, not like, you know, a big box, 20 meters high. But you can, what we have done is with a beauty contest to define with public, you see, oh, sorry, public municipalities, which is the best architecture, external architectures that all these buildings can have, so that can be better um, integrated in the landscape. And this is just some of the examples of what we had done. I was talking to one of your colleagues earlier who said that they were able to build something right into the side of this mountain that you would never even notice that there was a, a converter there or a substation there. So congratulations. I think it's really all about working with communities, right? Yeah. Um, let me turn to you, Ian, and talk a little bit about the Australian experience. I think there's a lot that can be learned about Australia and how Australia has handled enormous amounts of renewables, particularly solar. With your background in, in transmission and distribution, can you speak to maybe what some of those lessons learned were and what we should do or not do as the Aussies have done? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Uh, look, Australia is quite unique, of course, because it's an island to start right. off with. So uh, we don't have all these countries around us who we can link to quickly anyway. There's, there's You're on a, your own. <laughs> a conversation about linking to, to Singapore, but that's us supplying power. I'm not sure how that one's going at the moment. Um, <laughs> But we are an island, and if you and if you look at Australia, most of the energy infrastructure is on the east coast and down around around the south. In the middle, there's not much there at right. all, and then you've got uh, Perth on the edge. So uh, it's quite unique. Not much hydro, no nuclear, a lot of coal, black and brown, uh, good wind, good solar resources. So you know how do you how do you deal with that that problem from a transmission perspective? And Australia has the highest penetration of rooftop solar in the world. So it's currently running at 35%. So the edges of that transmission grid are quite skinny. As you get up to the top end of Queensland, towards Townsville and Cairns, it gets very skinny there. There's been a lot of solar put on there. And we're having issues with uh, system security and system strength. There's been a lot of work done on smart inverters and those sorts of things to try and uh, give that strength to the system. The same in South Australia. South Australia, we're having low load issues. Um, sometimes we go out and say that you know, we've met the market with 100% solar on this particular day for this amount of hours. They don't actually tell you that, oh, we're spinning generation as well. We've got gas going. We've constrained <laughs> all these solar power stations out there. All this energy is spilling, yeah. not going anywhere. So the challenge for us is, is to get that balance right. I think the other thing from a structural perspective is we're vertically disaggregated. So um, it was mentioned before, that, that, that brings with it certain problems because, again, we've got this a lot of solar being generated at the edge of the grid. We've still got the old centralised generation model. People say it's distributed, but, you know, it's connected by transmission, big renewable energy zones. So... In the planning process, the, the regulators and the market operator have certainly set forward zones to try and rationalise a transmission bill. Um, but I would say that looking at it from an end of grid perspective, middle grid, like 132,000 volts, 110, we're not using that network well. So some of the lessons we're, sort of, we're, we're learning is, um, or the challenges we've got, is that vertical disaggregation is causing issues. The market's extremely agile uh, in terms of distributed energy resources and batteries and EVs, etc. We need to get our heads across that. 
we're strengthening up those, uh, certainly the, the edges, over into South Australia so we can import more energy from there. We've got projects like the Battery of the Nation down in Tasmania, so we're uh, potentially building another uh, link uh, down from Tassie or up from Tassie to Victoria to utilise the hydro we've got. And the other big project is uh, Snowy Hydro and connecting to the grid. So getting those scarce resources for us, going away from the resources that we've got plenty of, mm -hmm. uh, the transmission grids become a critical. key critical issue in all that. And I'd say the other thing people might remember, the black summer of bushfires in mm -hmm. Australia. Uh, I'd say that's the first time some significant transmission assets came under risk uh, and that we had potential of, you know, losing power to large parts of the network. So um, we're on that sort of cutting edge uh, in terms of this island grid and, and keeping that network secure and reliability there. And, uh, quite a few lessons to learn, I think. Significant challenges for sure, to be sure. Ibrahim, let me turn to you. So Saudi Electricity Company is building transmission to other companies as and other countries as well. How do you deal with issues like ownership structure? How do you deal with the cost benefit allocation between the countries? And how do you deal with cross border permitting and siting? Uh, thank you. I, I just want to highlight that we have, uh, you know, uh, a huge ambitious uh, targets of uh, Vision 2030 of Saudi Arabia, and that one, uh, you know, has uh, a target 50% of the generation will be renewable, and we just started only connecting the, the first 3 gigawatt, and we will be reaching 70 gigawatt in 2030. So, so this ambitious target and plus uh, interconnecting with the neighboring country. These are challenges and a huge investment, more than $100 billion that will be invested in the next five to seven years. So uh, in addition to that is that we want to reach a security of supply, a target of security of, uh, of supply to be in the first quartile and, and, the, and globally. Uh, Interconnections, today we have under construction and interconnection with Egypt, which is uh, three gigawatt and it went uh, smoothly in coordination with, with, uh, with Egypt under construction to be uh, considered or, or um, forecasted to be in service by uh, 25. We have other uh, interconnections with Jordan, with Iraq, we already have an inter interconnection today with the uh, Gulf countries, you know, the GCC countries, the GCC states. Uh, it is uh, a few, you know, more than a decade now, this, uh, this uh, interconnection, and we are benefiting from it either in Saudi or in the uh, other states. Uh, it's an open uh, uh, gate for uh, uh, exchanging power within and securing the, especially securing the grids. The challenges that we are, going through today is 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 uh, uh, the supply chain, the long lead items that we have to build a big uh, infrastructure, a big uh, grid that we need to interconnect with the neighbors and the long lead items that are uh, slowing us down. It's not the investment that we are, we are worried about. I think we, have, we are capable of invest, investing. Uh, we have uh, target, uh, challenging targets that we have to meet. We are uh, uh, going there in a very uh, speed and rapid, uh, uh, rapidly going on, on 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 building and designing these projects. But the, the issue is, uh, are we uh, able to uh, uh, to construct it on time? You know, in a short time, it will take some time for uh, for that. But. Uh, we are we are in 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 agreements. We are signing just recently signed an agreement with with uh, by uh, Ministry of uh, Energy. His Royal Highness signed an agreement with the Iraqi side that we will have a new interconnection with Iraq. It will be supporting Iraq. We are uh, in future planning to to have uh, seventy gigawatt of of renewable. Uh, it will in uh, these interconnections will will. will um, will enable this power to be exported uh, outside the kingdom. Thank you for bringing up supply chain, because I think that was an area that I was going to cover in a, in a minute, but let's talk about it now. We're all dealing with supply chain issues, both on a business level and a personal level. I'd like to ask each of you for your respective companies, 
how are you dealing with the supply chain constraints in the transmission side of the house? You know, is there something that governments could do either in the short, mid or long term, or is it just something that's going to take time to work its, its way out? So I don't know. Uh, do you want to start, David? Yeah, I'm very happy to. I mean, I, I went to uh, Sharm El Sheikh actually uh, November last year to, uh, to, to COP27 and um, it was going to that kind of form or, or something like the Jeff uh, here today where you suddenly realise the size of the scale of the problem for the supply chain. You know, you can think about it in your own geography or your own individual jurisdiction and you stand back and you look at it, uh, you know, uh, on the world scale and it's just absolutely, uh, absolutely phenomenal. So um, my belief is, uh, Geisha, is that, you know, as TSOs, we need to start behaving differently as clients. Um, and in particular, we need to be thinking about how we um, make it easier um, for members of the supply chain to actually work with us and how we uh, develop some longer term arrangements and partnerships in, in order to deliver. So let me give you a couple of examples. So. You know, we, we've all spoken about, you know, big engineering interconnection projects. But, you know, around the world, we used to do about four or five HVDC, you know, kind of projects per year. Um, and just across uh, America and, uh, and Europe, you're talking about over 75 credible projects today. And credible, I mean, in the, in the next, you know, out to 2030. It's just absolutely phenomenal. So... And every single one of those HVDC projects, when you're spending a billion pounds or, or, or dollars, um, uh, they're all bespoke to the individual client. And I think one of the things Jay Karma and I were, were, were talking about this earlier is we need to standardize those products so that the supply chain can, can, can deliver them uh, to us. Um, we've just been asked by our regulator to build 17 new transmission circuits and uh, spend 20 billion pounds by 2030. And to do that, it's a huge undertaking, but we're going to completely and utterly change uh, the way that we deliver infrastructure um, and go to much more of what we would call an enterprise model rather than, rather than a project-by-project project, uh, type approach. And in that kind of model, you are doing things like um, uh, you know, only having one set of logistics for all of the logistics being set up for the whole of the, uh, whole of the enterprise. Uh, you're collaborating on community-based uh, solutions, local in the communities. Yeah. Um, you're having, uh, you know, training uh, facilities to bring the engineers and the, uh, and the technicians that are going to build those assets as a collective rather than doing individuals. So I think it needs a change and a different set of approaches in order to address some of these big, big supply chain problems. Giacomo or Ian, anything you'd like to add? Oh, I was just going to say, I think uh, human resources uh, is, is a significant issue, particularly in Australia, because uh, we haven't built many mm. transmission systems for quite some time. No, no, the sort of links that we're talking about. A lot of connections now to solar and, uh, and wind, but at the scale that it's got to be built. So the, the RAB of the uh, Australian Networks 22 bill, the uh, federal government's put up $20 billion program called uh, Rewire the Nation. And there's $12 billion of projects that are being accelerated right now. So, so those skill sets, uh, as well as the materials that you refer to, it's, it's a real challenge. And, and the, the fact that it's global, as you say, is, is a critical one. Like I've been through a period when I was running one of the utilities in Queensland, we had sea change. We had changing criteria of security and um, we had a mining boom occurring. We had to increase capacity by 30-odd percent a year. And we were buying supply chains and, and, and equipment like EWPs. We had to make it attractive to go to regional Queensland rather than Melbourne or Sydney. And so you really got to think through those issues. But when you look at it a global perspective and you're coming off COVID and you've got silicon chip issues and all these sorts of things, and then you get into the minerals and, and things like copper and aluminium and concrete, all those areas. It's you wonder in some areas I've got to go fast before you know, and we've got to cooperate as an industry, but I, I, I do need to move quickly, otherwise I'm gonna be left sitting on the fence. And other areas it might mean you're mm -hmm. gonna go slower because it's just not available. Right. Um, it's amazing. Big challenge. It's amazing. Yeah, I think that <clears throat> the first point is actually uh, as David mentioned it is to make 
uh, life a bit easier for the suppliers. So standardization, modularization, that's probably part of the solution. But if you, if you look at, you know, the number of projects which are on the market and are, are expected to become reality, uh, this is not enough. So we think that it can be a different approach with a sharing of risk between, you know, suppliers and TSOs and uh, possibility uh, to invest and uh, integrate part of the supply chain. Um, Terna has already done it in the past. You know, we have Tamini, which is a, a transformer manufacturer. And uh, three years ago, we purchased Brook Cables, which is a Swiss-based uh, uh, cable manufacturer. And, you know, this is just to, to help us, you know, to, to go ahead with installations for transformers and uh, AC underground cables, which we are using a lot in particular, you know, to cope with the resilience in it. So we think that also on uh, some other critical uh, items, HVDC in particular, that's probably, you know, the type of approach we should have. Just completely going into the supply chain. And, and you know, and find a sort of a sharing of risk and resources with yeah. the suppliers. Fascinating. Is there anything else that you want to add, Ibrahim, or do you feel like you've covered that in your prior remarks? No, I, I, I might elaborate something on the supply chain. Let's put it, you know, uh, different uh, uh, steps first, which, which was mentioned, you know, the standardization and uh, uh, going to the design itself, standardizing, making it easier for the OEMs, you know, to produce uh, uh, a mass production, which is standardized. This is one part. The other part is that uh, uh, the process itself engaged, being engaged with the suppliers. This is, uh, this is very important. And I'll just give you an example. You know, we had uh, during the COVID uh, period, we had to, we had a big project that we will replace all our, our uh, customer meters to smart meters, 10 million we have replaced within one year only. And wow. to, in order to do that, in order to do that, we have to be engaged closely with the OEMs. We had to, uh, one of the, you know, things that we have to do also localize um, uh, some of the products and uh, we, local, we, we produce locally 30% of these, uh, uh, of these quantities and uh, we have to be get involved in the shipments itself. We have to manage the shipments and the transportation for uh, these goods. So, to, in in today's world, I think uh, uh, the 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 owner, as we have to do, is get engaged in all the process of the supply chain. So that uh, plus giving incentives to the to the supplier to the suppliers to localize their products. Uh, regionally, I mean, within the region, and this is uh, this is what I what I advise. You know, the global uh, big uh, pro uh, product pro producers, OEM, that they should localize because the demand in the future is increasing. You know, it's, it's there is a big demand globally, and uh, uh, they cannot stick only to few uh, facilities that are producing limited uh, uh, capacity. Uh, in the the the. I think we can. We we will be able to manage the normal standard uh, products, but what also has been mentioned is that the, the advanced technology, which is coming, for, especially for the HPDC, the power electronics, are limited in the world. You know, the manufacturers or in facilities. This is what they did. I think to focus to uh, increase their production and do something because. The demand is growing very high, especially with the integration of renewables. It is it will be required that these power electronics will be produced in a massive uh, quantities. Thank you for that. So let me shift let me shift uh, gears a little bit and talk about innovation and the important role that innovation is going to play in everything we do in the future. There are so many innovative technologies and approaches that are out there right now on the transmission space. Um, I'm curious as to how your respective companies integrate global research that's happening on transmission and what of these technologies are you most excited about? Shall I go? Shall I? Yeah. So one of, the, uh, one of the things we changed a few years uh, back now is uh, we set up a venture capitalist uh, uh, innovation fund based out in California. <laughs> Um, and we've invested $400 million in 36 different startup companies over that period. And we don't just invest in any mm -hmm. company. We only invest in companies who uh, we think are going to be successful, they've got a right product, but um, also successful 
in producing uh, uh, something that we think we can use in our regulated businesses. So you're effectively pulling on two value levers and then anything those companies actually do make, we then reinvest back in. Is that National Grid Partners? It's National Grid Partners, yeah. And it's been a phenomenal uh, model for really accelerating, um, bringing innovation uh, mm -hmm. into the organisation and, um, and getting engineers really excited about doing different things. And as a consequence of, of that, you know, we've, we've been able to reduce uh, bills quite considerably uh, for, for our customers. So. Um, it's just one example, yeah. I think, of behaving differently sure. in order to... Uh, so what are you excited up. about? What innovative transmission thing are you well, excited about? One of, one of the things, I think Joachim has said it before, but you know, one of the things I think we all need to do is we need to think about our existing assets just as much as those new ones, right? And how we get as much possible capacity out of the existing right-of-ways um, uh, that we've got in our territory. So, um, you know, we're working with a... With a, with a new uh, um, transmission conductor that will be double the capacity of existing transmission conductors. We're also working with another startup company um, over here in the US um, who um, is, is looking at superconductors um, for overhead line, 10 times the kind of capacity you'd get on an existing uh, line. But we're also doing other things. You know, um, we're thinking about how do you do an insulating cross arm? Mm. So at the moment, the, the voltage you can have is, is dependent on the, the dis distance Space. between the individual phases. If you insulate the cross arm, you can increase the voltage on the same size tower. So Exciting. a few example, plus Exciting. all the digital stuff, you know, there's a huge amount of that. Ibrahim, well. let me go to you. Uh, let's talk about innovation and how you're incorporating it into your company and what you're excited about. Uh, we, we've been lucky, you know, the last decade that we are implementing the latest technology in our grid. And... Uh, uh, if, you, if you look at our substations, we have about 70% of our substations are uh, fully automated uh, with the latest technology. Uh, the thing is not innovation, not in the, in, the, in the asset itself or the product itself. Even the processes need to be, we, we need to have uh, uh, innovations. What are we doing today is that we are uh, uh, even focusing on the process to assure the asset integrity and uh, uh, increase the the reliability of the of the assets and the grid. Uh, one of the uh, new things that we are we might be the first uh, who will who will implement it in the future. Uh, we started implementing uh, re reliable centralized maintenance lately, but plus that we are uh, we are utilizing the artificial intelligence to analyze the data and the healthiness that we are uh, the health of the assets uh, uh, that we have to assure. Uh, we did a lot of uh, data analytics that improved our uh, resilience and our response and readiness for, for uh, interruptions, incidents, and uh, uh, asset uh, failures. So, so we, we have utilized the, the, the uh, new technology, the digital uh, technology in this aspect in the process itself, and not only just in the assets and the, in the technology, I mean, uh, the product itself. Ian or Giacomo, anything you'd well, like to add? Yeah, well, uh, what I can say is that we're doing something similar. Uh, in addition, you know, we're looking at technology that help make uh, our investments sustainable. Uh, just an, ex an example, you know, in the Mediterranean Sea, we have Posidonia, which is a protected seaweed. So you cannot lay cables on Posidonia because this can destroy it. So what we have done is to find um, new companies that are able to do a sort of a transplant of Posidonia before you, you lay the cable and then you, you put it again on it. Um, that is something that has allowed us to receive the approval by you know, the ministry in order to go ahead with uh, our new investments uh, across the, uh, the sea. Awesome. And that's, you know, a strange type of, you know, innovation but that we are looking at. But if it helps you site or permit, it's critical. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think on the, uh, I guess we're being focused on on digital twins. Mm -hmm. So uh, one project we're doing is a full digital twin of Tasmania, the whole island. And so when you get down into the transmission networks in terms of route selections, etc., because we've got all the terrain models, we've got all the vegetation, we know where all the buildings are around the side. The process of consultation and process of route selection is significantly improved. But also taking into perspective disaster resilience, you know, going through forests, you know, what are the falling uh, heights of the trees, et cetera. 
Over the top of that, some of the Australian utilities are looking at the IoT over the top. I'm going through a, a number of um, landholder areas. So how can I add value to them? So with the farmers, we're talking about digital twin agricultural that's underneath the farm. The IoT connection networks that's looking at conductor clearances and everything is providing services to the customer. So when you, you're having this discussion about building this big transmission network down you know, through the paddock, and the comp and at the in Australia at the moment the compensations I think it's ten thousand dollars a year for twenty five years that's pretty new, and that's re reasonably good money. But when you start having another conversation about well we can make your farm smart and we can give you um, digital overlay we can sense your your soil moisture you can get your productivity up, so it's not just the compensation for the lack of amenity uh, and space. Here we can make your farm smart. So you start to partner with with the people that you're putting the easement. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, we're about out of time, so we're gonna do a quick lightning round. Any last thoughts that you'd like to leave our audience today? Start with Ian. Uh, look, I, I just, yeah, it's uh, gonna be a significant challenge, but obviously uh, we get to, I think everyone's target's much the same, zero by 2050. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think what Lawrence tries to do around getting collaboration globally about these issues is quite important because we're all going to be drawing from the same markets. It's going to uh, create inflation issues. Projects are going to come under pressure and uh, it really needs not just us working with vendors but working across. With each other. Ibrahim? Yes, so I think with the, with the, with the growth in, in uh, renewable and uh, and uh, pr production of, uh, of energy in the world and the demand is coming, uh, the network, the transmission network is, will play a, a very crucial role in connecting these generations to the customers. Uh, even with the, with the distributed, distribu distributed generation that will be uh, coming. Plus is that uh, not only the investment, but also uh, investing in the latest technologies and the dig digital. Uh, drones, robots, uh, intelligence uh, systems that will uh, improve the resilience and uh, increase the reliability of, uh, of the network. This is very crucial, very important with the challenges that are coming with the renewable uh, integration. Thank you. Giacomo? Well, just add that, um, you know, for in order to, to manage the challenges of the decarbonization there is not just one solution that fits everyone and every place. So there are different things that have to be managed. So only with um, exchange of experiences, you know, different TSOs or different players can find the right solutions and the right mix of solutions to be applied. Super. Last word. I think uh, for me, the last word will be about modeling actually, because mm. You know, we're living in a world where the climate around us is rapidly uh, changing. And, um, you know, we all, all operate reliable networks today because of the engineers that have gone before mm -hmm. us in building those and the engineering standards. But those standards aren't relevant mm -hmm. in, in tomorrow's um, or even in today's uh, climate. So we're, we're investing a lot, actually, in how do you take climate data and then model that through to actually physically what does that then mean for the impacts on your assets in each of the, the geographical locations that those assets are, because the warming effects is, are, are not the same everywhere. Um, so you, you know, when you've got millions of assets on your individual networks, you kind of need to know what's going to happen to them and when. And uh, and so modelling is a big, uh, big investment for us. That sounds pretty smart. Let's give our panelists a warm round of applause. Thank you.